today at the National Press Club, former US Navy Secretary Richard Spencer, who also served in the US Marine Corps as a helicopter pilot. His address comes less than a week after the AUKUS nuclear-powered submarine deal was detailed. Richard Spencer with today's Press Club address. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia in Canberra for today's Westpac address. My name is Andrew Tillett, I'm a political correspondent for the Australian Financial Review and Vice President here at the club. Our guest today is former US Secretary of the Navy and Global Chair of Investment and Advisory Firm Bondi Partners, Richard Spencer. Mr Spencer, or Secretary Spencer, or Captain Spencer in, in his previous lives was a marine aviator rising to the ranks of captain before switching to a career on Wall Street. In 2017, he became the 76th Naval Secretary. But like many officials in the Trump administration, his tenure ended in tears, sadly. Um, Mr Spencer appears at the club just days after Australia, the US and the United Kingdom announced the optimal pathway for Australia's acquisition for nuclear-powered submarines, the AUKUS arrangement. You can follow the conversation on Twitter at Press Club Ost, or hashtag NPC. Everyone, please welcome Richard Spencer to the stage. Andrew, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And Morris, thank you for the introduction to be speaking here today in front of this august group. Um, you might... Uh, wonder what we're going to talk about today. And I want to tell you that I'm not one to bloviate. I want to present to you my opinions and my ideas about AUKUS. And then I want to open it up to questions and answers, because I believe that's where we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. As I stand up here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am a private person with uh, my opinions. I'd like that to be known. And I'll fall back on the American humorist Will Rogers all I know is what I read from the papers, and that's my alibi. <laughs> As Andrew referenced, I know you all know, earlier this week, leaders of Australia, the UK, and the United States announced the goals of AUKUS, a momentous step forward. A momentous step forward, I believe, in the correct direction to address the security of Australia and the Indo-Pacific region. I personally could not be more excited, not just about the headlines, about submarines, but more the impetus that AUKUS will provide for our coordinated efforts going forward in the critical areas that we all know we focus on. You might call them core areas. In the DOD, they're calling them tenants of technology. But let us talk about quantum. Let us talk about AI, biotechnology, rare earths, critical issues that we're all facing that we must count, you know, tackle going forward. I'm a firm believer that there's so much we can do together. If I remember my time uh, in the Pentagon, Jim Mattis would uh, had a couple of great statements, and one of his was, you know, we can't walk this path alone. We're going to do this with this great constellation of friends and allies that we have. And let me provide you the context for my belief. I was confirmed as Secretary of the Navy in August of 2017, and my first official outing was to be the guest of Ambassador Joe Hockey at the Embassy of Australia in Washington, D.C. It was a very memorable meeting for me for two reasons. One, I got to meet Joe Hockey and his lovely wife, and that blossomed into a friendship that ended up Joe and I being business partners together today. Two, I was, the, the, the whole understanding I had of the relationship with Australia was crystallized because we were talking about the 99 years of mateship that we had. And it really brought it to a fine point. I'm an admirer of history, and any chance that I get, whether it be in the US or abroad, I love to talk about our relationship with Australia. Because you, Australia, provided your treasure, your men and women, to fight alongside us with General Menashe in World War I, in World War II, the Cold War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, Gulf War I, Somalia, the War on Terror, Gulf War II, 
Afghanistan and counter ISIL in both Iraq and Syria. If this is not a relationship that is annealed in a crucible, I don't know what is. You, Australia, are front and center on the stage. And we will stand beside you with firm resolve like two interlocking bands of steel. We must, we will, we have to. There's too much to be done. The submarine announcement is exceptional for many reasons. And the specifics have been discussed in detail last week, and I'm more than happy to take any questions later on. It is the first step where three countries will be sharing technologies, skill sets, and manpower to bring a new military capability to Australia. Having had exposure to the nuclear-powered naval program, the impact that it had not only on national security in the U.S., but also research and development, technology, manufacturing, and employment was very impressive, to say the least. I will also say that the resources needed to develop and maintain such a platform are daunting. We must be candid about that. But the consumption of those resources should be weighed against the benefits that come from what we just mentioned. The subs are today's headlines and the first steps. But there is more. I truly believe there's much more. I believe AUKUS is the catalyst for the three partners to immediately begin coordinating policy to address the competitive environment we face now. If we acknowledge that this is a period of great power competition, then we need to take action, meaningful action. Policy does not do, doers do, but we need policy as a foundation. And what do I mean by meaningful action? I mean the coordinated whole of government approach. When we talk about national security, and regional security, we think of our militaries. Investing in defense capabilities are critical. Again, I quote Jim Mattis, who said, the reason you want to have a strong military is to give the State Department one more day to make their point. But the military is just one arrow in our quiver, ladies and gentlemen, and I truly believe there's a longer, more powerful arrow in the quiver, and that is commerce. If we look at industrial process, a key of policy that we have to put forward. I'll look most recently at the CHIPS Act, possibly the first industrial policy the U.S. has laid down since the Cold War. And already $70 billion worth of capital is flowing and Earth is being moved for a multiple of, ch of chip forges, foundries, I beg your pardon, in the U.S. This is what we call focused reaction and focused work. We need to do the, we need to do the same thing, the same directed policy, I believe, for rare earths, quantum computing, biotechnologies, all those pillars that I just mentioned. I think required reading for both political leaders and corporate leaders should be a book called Freedom's Forge by Arthur Herman. It describes the impact of industrial policy in the US during World War II. In 1936, the board of directors of the Ford Motor Company were anxiously wringing their hands because they had a decision to make, to invest a large amount of capital into a facility that was to be called Willow Run. Willow Run was directed by industrial policy to produce aircraft parts for the Consolidated Aircraft Company in Los Angeles, which was making at that point the largest bomber produced. It was a four-engine bomber called the B-24 Liberator. That aircraft alone was one of the main ingredients for victory in the European theater. They made the decision and they built a 3,500,000 square foot building. That's 83 acres. And they were producing parts by 1940. And Henry Ford, being the industrial process maven that he was, realized that the California Consolidated aircraft company was not keeping up with the parts that he was manufacturing, and the Department of Defense was screaming for more aircraft. He brought production to Willow Run, where they actually started producing the aircraft. In 1941, November of 1941, they reached their pace. They were building one B-24 Liberator an hour. Stunning. When they closed the factory after Victory Day, 1945, 
Willow Run had produced 8,685 airframes. That, ladies and gentlemen, is focused industrial policy and focused government policy. Are we at war today? No, we are not. I use that just as an example of how we can focus government and private practice together to have outcomes that we need. Our focus doesn't need to be totally military-centric, as I just said. We have to coordinate this across all of government. And as I look at that as American, I mean State Department, Commerce, DOD, Education, Energy, Agriculture, Transportation. They cannot be siloed. And oh, by the way, we do this in concert, in concert with our allies. We can do this if, in fact, we have the comms, the communications between us. The recent uh, Inflation Act, which addressed electric cars, was not a good example of how we should have done that. We should have been speaking to our allies and, and, and actually getting input so everyone knew which way everyone was going, because we are in this together, and we have to be linked in our way forward. If we have the fortitude, and folks, I don't think we have a choice on this, we have to have the fortitude, it will take a tremendous amount of effort and thinking outside the box. Business as usual is no longer. But these efforts, combined with government and commercial efforts, would contribute to the regional security above and beyond the military investment. It would be a beacon for others to join the effort to compete. History has proven that allies and friends' commitments to each other only are strengthened through trade. So now we've entered this period of great power competition. Everyone seems to agree and use the term, but what does it mean? We see growing military budgets around the world. It's good stuff, specifically in the Indo-Pacific region. Everyone's responding to this concept of great power competition. But I propose, again, there's more to great power competition than military budgets, planes, and submarines. In light of AUKUS, we should embrace the competition. Not so much deny people technologies, our competitors. Let us compete one-on-one, -on -one, head on head. Our countries have not meaningfully faced off a competitor since World War II or arguably the Cold War. We need to get back into the weight room, folks. I know speaking for the US, we're a little flabby in this. We have not competed. We've had salad days. Now it's time to put the shoulder to the grindstone. We also don't have the luxury of time in my eyes. So urgency and agility are the operative words. We must provide the private sector the guidelines to compete. Knock down the speed bumps. And I specifically am talking about ITAR, to be very frank with you. When I hear that there's a concern about the Virginia-class supply chain in regards to AUKUS, that the, that the supply chain will be stretched at two points a year, I have to pause and think about the Ford Motor Company and Willow Run. And then I get excited. Can we step up? Yes, we can, collectively. Will it be difficult? It will be very difficult. Will it involve governments to work together? Yes, it will. Will it take unflinching leadership and consistency? Yes. Sum that all up, this will be difficult. But the product of these efforts will provide security and a strengthened global commercial enterprise that will endear and endure for generations. It is sustainable. This, I believe, should be the actual goal of August. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring Winston Churchill into this conversation because we talked about World War II. I'm a kind of a data freak, and I like to have metrics of what success looks like. And on this, I think success can be framed by an editorialized quote from our great leader and statesman. Leave the past to history, especially as we propose to write that history ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard Spencer, thank you for your speech. Uh, I'll kick off the questions. And you mentioned ITARs in there. The, um, for, for people at home, it's basically rules around uh, arms control selling for the US to sell exports, arms exports. Um, 
it, it, obviously, America is very, quite probably quite rightly, guards its, its safeguards, its military technology and who it shares it with. But in AUKUS, nuclear submarines, it's the most sensitive technology, we're told, that the US has. With Pillar 2, we're seeing things like um, hypersonics and other new weapons and, and at, the, at the cutting edge, which will be equally sensitive. How do we sort of work through Congress in particular in terms of uh, cutting through the, the, these ITAR regulations and, and ensuring that it can, this technology can be shared with Australia as seamlessly as possible? It probably is the biggest speed bump that we have to uh, overcome in light of my whole presentation that we have to do this together, and I truly believe we do for m many reasons. This is a firm example of 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 10. But um, I, I think you're seeing a change happening. Uh, I don't want to speak for Congress. This is just my observation of what's going on in members of the House Armed Service Committee, the Senate Armed Service Committee, HACD, SACD, uh, in Congress in general. And it, it started with the Ukraine. Uh, we used to be very, very coveted of our, of our data and intelligence. And we really started sharing it quite a bit. You've all reported on it, I'm sure, and you know of it. And that was kind of the beginning, I think, of the shift. Um, I was very impressed when your Minister of Defense pushed the uh, Secretary of Defense on ITAR. Uh, I think that push should become more of a shove, to be very frank with you. We'll do our work on our side. There's many people in the U.S. that want to see the ITAR regulations uh, either eradicated or relaxed when it comes to working with our, um, with our allies. Uh, being in the venture business uh, continually on a global basis, I'm hearing, you know, Richard, we got a great technology, and the, and the next statement might be from, I can't bring it into the U.S. because I can't get it out, or I don't even want to address it with the U.S. because ITAR is going to trip me up. I hear that, and I go, my God, you have a technology we have to have in our portfolio. What can we do to get around this? It's been talked up. It's been pushed. It will be pushed. There is a, there is a goal up there to have ITAR eliminated and or by exception. And what I mean by that is ITAR re, uh, regulations are relaxed. And if, in fact, there is an exceptional technology, that is taken up on a one-case basis. But we have to get this speed bump out of the way. You all have so many great technologies here in Australia that I would love to see both of us working on. And also, we have some great technologies that we'd like to bring over to combine. And they have the same worry that the minute they bring it over to Australia or any foreign country and try to get it back, they're, in it, they're wrapped up in the ITAR conundrum. Uh, it, it, it has to be addressed. It will be addressed. And all I can, all I can ask from um, uh, Canberra is to press the issue also yourselves, because enough people pushing things will change. What, what do we need from an Australian perspective to give the assurance to, to our American um, partners that that they can share this technology with us safely. You know, it's sort of, it's sort of the, the discussion is wrapped around that Congress won't change. And, you know, obviously anyone who's a, familiar with the American political system probably quite understands it, seeing how, how, how dysfunctional Congress can be. But, you know, what is it from an Australian perspective is needed? First of all, um, and I go back to my time at Navy, um, Australia owns a very interesting relationship in the minds of Congress. I think of any one of our allies, you will get the first pass. Uh, it's a very unique uh, uh, point of view that the U.S. holds, but it's appreciative. And I think uh, if, in fact, we're going to have an exception to start this conversation, it's Australia. I don't think you have to prove anything other than, you know, coordinated safeguards uh, that are already outlined. I think there is a desire. Uh, especially when it comes to specifically the Indo-Pacific region and specifically Australia, that you will get movement. Cool. All right, our first question from the floor, Kim Bergman. Uh, Kim Bergman from Asia Pacific Defence Reporter. Thank you very much for your speech. Um, there's another very close ally of the United States that's looking for new submarines, and that, of course, is Canada. If Canada were to ask the United States for exactly the same deal on Virginia submarines, as Australia is getting, what would be the response of the U.S.? Again, um, I am not in the policy-making arm of the United States government. I'm no longer in the United States government. It comes down to business. It comes down to production. It comes down to supply chain. If, in fact, the United States wanted to take a Willow Run point of view, could we produce three to four Virginia-class submarines in a, you know, in a cycle? 
there might be room, but there would have to be quite a bit of change in our ability to produce to accommodate that. Okay, well, just further to that, um, is the ability of the USN to give away three or five uh, Virginia-class submarines testimony to the fact that they didn't really need that many in the first place? No, the Virginia-class submarine is not only probably one of our best acquisition programs, it is uh, as far as uh, a, a sensor, a weapons delivery program, one of the best platforms that we have. If you speak to anybody in the United States Navy, uh, whether it be surface, air, or undersea, more Virginia-class submarines. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next question, uh, Anna Henderson. Thank you. Anna Henderson from SBS World News and National Indigenous Television. You have spoken about the capability of the nuclear submarines, the Virginia class that we would be having in this rotational deployment off the west of Australia. Will they have the capacity, in your understanding, to be nuclear armed? And do you think it would be appropriate in that rotational deployment that they do have nuclear arms? Uh, I can't comment on that, to be very frank with you. I'm sorry. That's okay, because I have another one. Uh, so you also spoke about the two interlocking bands of steel between Australia and the US. So in the case of a, a war beginning over Taiwan, do you expect those two interlocking bands of steel to move essentially in a three-legged race together uh, to deal with that conflict? Well, let us remember that uh, uh, the Virginia-class submarines coming to Australia, sovereignty remains with Australia. Um, it would depend upon tactical deployment and the agreements between the two uh, uh, defense departments. When you look, though, at the broader context here, given that we are now so interconnected, sharing this technology and sharing our alliance in the face of China's power, what do you think is the likely outcome if Taiwan was to become a flashpoint for Australia? Let us, one, hope it never becomes a flashpoint, to be very frank with you. Uh, there is no good outcome. Uh, on either side of the equation. Um, I would hope that Australia is beside us. Uh, I can't look into the future and see uh, uh, what is going to happen, but I would hope you'd be beside us if, in fact, that's the path we take. I actually would like more, more opinions at the table when it comes to something about uh, going to conflict. Uh, it always helps. Thank you. On, on Taiwan, uh, Richard Spencer, is the, the policy of strategic ambiguity, where we have this question mark over whether the US would actually come to Taiwan's aid if it was attacked, has that had its day, do you think, in, with what we're seeing with the, the, the build-up in, 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 in the PRC? Well, one of the interesting things about the PRC is they publish their timelines uh, in the open press. Uh, another thing to remember, um, and I truly believe it has, it has applicability here, is if you take Sun Tzu's art of war, uh, the second credo is to basically own your adversary's assets without ever firing a shot. Um, you look at the way China works, probe, react, probe, react, probe, react. Uh, are, they, are they wanting, if in fact uh, we, we talk about conflict uh, with Taiwan, are they wanting it? Not at this point, I don't believe. Will they want it at some point? Hopefully what we have here in the solution of AUKUS uh, is that projection of power is in fact a meaningful weight on the scale of making a decision. It's, um, it certainly seems though, I mean, when you see U US military officials talk about the timeline getting shorter and, and things like that, it does feel that we are sort of moving more and more closer to the, to, the, to the prospect of war, doesn't it? Well, you have to remember what the job of the military is. The military, um, and I mean this complimentary, it's a hammer looking for a nail. Their job is to be ready to fight. Their job is to be ready to fight tonight. Um, so that is what they're preparing for, and that is what they should prepare for. And when you hear from them, that is the story that you're going to hear. But you also have other counteracting parts of government, such as the State Department, uh, such as the Commerce Department, such as the Treasury Department, other tools that can be used uh, in a situation like that. So balance out what you hear and where you're hearing it from. Uh, and again, I don't mean that to undermine the militaries whatsoever, but that is their job. Our next question from uh, Melissa Code. Hello, Mr. Spencer. Melissa Code from the Mandarin. You referenced contracting parts of uh, government. Uh, 
which act in, in orchestra and in context of that hammer looking for the nail. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of those being the president. <coughs> In 2019, if we can return in the context of your history um, theme. Albeit brief, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, you wrote uh, after your tenure ended that the command influence of Mr. Trump had negative implications for military justice and the rule of law, but it could be said that volatility and that style of leadership also has implications for geopolitics and a relationship like AUKUS. Can you tell us whether uh, the right changes have been made to prevent something like that negatively impacting something like the AUKUS agreement in future, um, and whether the US has learned that lesson? That's a terrific question, and it's very observant. I would, I would say um, since January uh, of the great problem that we had in Washington, a lot has been learned, a lot has been observed. I will not be as naive as to say that the U.S. is homogeneous in its thoughts. Uh, our little experiment of democracy allows for a lot of different points of view. I do believe, though, that uh, Congress does its job in counteracting uh, or being a counterweight to the executive branch, and I think the system does work well in that regard. If I can ask another question, um, can you walk us through at what point you decided that relationship with the president was intractable and you couldn't navigate continuing on in your role? For those of you who, uh, who might not know, uh, my altercation with my commander in chief was based on a suit, uh, uh, actually a lawsuit, a court martial, I beg your pardon, from uh, a special operator by the name of Chief Petty Officer uh, Eddie Gallagher. And uh, I'll compress it. Um, because the press got behind, uh, the conservative press got behind the fact that they thought the Navy was railroading Chief Gallagher. When I first arrived at um, the Post in 2017, we, there were many issues that were going on with the Special Operating Forces. They've been deployed a tremendous amount of times. Um, command and control in certain situations was maybe gray. In the Navy, with the SEALs, we put into place through um, Admiral Tim Scamanci a, a program to bring us back to ethical true north because we were having deviation from the norm. And what I mean by deviation from the norm is you let something go by because it's a small issue and you're four degrees off center and everything still works. And then another issue, which is a little more grievous, bends it seven degrees off north, and you go, oh, we're still good. Well, sooner or later, you're 90 degrees off, and the, and, and, and the arrow breaks. So we had started a whole new program with incoming new special operators. The SEALs that uh, turned in Eddie Gallagher were the graduates of that new program. So I was heartened because I believe the program works. Um, the president got very much involved in the case. Um, the Navy had a hard time trying the case, to be very frank with you. Uh, it was a Perry Mason moment in that uh, we provided amnesty to one of the special operators without asking him if he had killed the enemy combatant in question. And for those of you who covered the story, you know exactly what happened at the 11th hour. They bring him up to the stand and he said, Chief Gallagher didn't kill the enemy combatant, I did. And double jeopardy, he can't be tried. That was a total whiff on our part on the Navy, to be very frank with you. My altercation with the President of the United States was in the administrative end. Uh, Chief Gallagher was acquitted of everything but being uh, having a photograph taken with the enemy combatant with a knife to his neck, if you remember, which right there I think is absolutely egregious for many reasons, not only for what it did for other Navy special operators and or anyone wearing a uniform, but what it did as far as our enemies looking at it, going, oh, they preach this, but they do that. So it was very meaningful that we handled this case appropriately. Now we're retiring. Eddie Gallagher out the door. All I wanted to do was to get Chief Gallagher in front of his peers and have his peers review his record. 
if in fact his peers said he can keep his trident, he can remain a SEAL for the rest of his life, I was perfectly okay, they'd pass the decision. If in fact they came back and said he is no longer a SEAL, we'll remove his trident, the deal that I was trying to strike with the White House was I will give Chief Gallagher his metal, his uh, seal token back to keep the president at bay, to be very frank, because nothing good could come of this. We were trying to protect the institution and let the institution heal. The community, the special operators community, knew what happened. That was the most important thing. Me giving him his trident back was tin. Uh, the president turned around and said, no, you will not put him in front of a peer review board. And I said, yes, I will. And he said, you're fired. You said you wished that you'd consulted the Secretary of Defense um, rather than make some independent decisions as the interventions and things were bubbling along. Can you tell us a bit more about why that would have been? Yeah, yeah Secretary Esper was traveling in Asia at that time, and I was briefing his chief of staff, which in most cases, that's briefing the principal. And whether Secretary Esper chose to say he was briefed or not, I have no idea but he feigned ignorance to my dealings in the White House, but yet his chief of staff knew exactly what we were doing. Thank you. Um, thank you for, the, for that. I, I was a little familiar with the, the story, but thank you for illuminating us all on that. And our next question is um, from Matthew Knott. Hi, Secretary. Um, <clears throat> along a similar line as uh, Melissa there, uh, you lived through the volatility of the Trump years. Uh, Australians watched it closely from here. There is a lot of concern about the political uh, implications of AUKUS between now and the decade where we're hoping the first Virginia sub arrives. Uh, do you think it is guaranteed that future administrations will support the transfer of this technology? We're also seeing the increased isolationism within the Republican Party around Ukraine. How confident we, should we be that this will outlast the Biden administration? That's a great question, and this is why I believe there's so much more to AUKUS than the submarines. Um, joining forces now in a competitive, to, to answer competition can only strengthen the permanency of it. I will never second guess the United States Congress, um, but I truly believe that there is an understanding about the competition with China that is bipartisan, or, or, or nonpartisan, I should say. So I feel fairly confident that, that in the near term, let's call it seven years, yes. Uh, it's all going to depend upon what happens. If we have a huge peace dividend all of a sudden, if the PRC rolls over and now we're dealing with the people of China in a different framework, it might be different. I'm hoping not because we still need security in the region. And to have you all to have this capability only helps all of us. I, and you said before about you would hope to see Australia participate in, in a war fought over Taiwan. What would be the argument for Australia to participate in such a war? Yeah, I, I'd love to change the phrase. I wouldn't love to see any of us go to war over Taiwan. No. Uh, I would like to see the cooperation uh, of us all together because it's going to be, it's going to impact the whole region um, uh, massively. Um, is there any one impetus? No, I think this has to be a growing discussion as to how it goes forward. And again, as I've said, and I truly believe this, the more voices at the table, the better. Because you want to actually met out every single option, and more importantly, every single second and third and fourth order of effect, which ends up being the thing that bites us in the ankle most of the time. Thank you. Can I just go back to, to Matthew's first question there about, you know, I guess this concern about if another Trump-like figure becomes president and, and it puts a cloud over AUKUS. What, what, what needs to actually be done to so, sort of bait this in the American system? And, and, it, and it's not just about if, if Trump or, or someone like him comes back, but also too we see sort of, you know, all through this process there were suggestions that the, the US Navy would perhaps not be so keen to share nuclear submarine technology. Um, if we have someone from the left like a... a, 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 a a, a Jeremy Corbyn-esque type figure uh, get elected a leader in either the US or UK, that might also sort of um, put uh, this agreement in, in doubt. So what, 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 what needs to get this sort of the institutional underpinnings that it will survive? You really, so it, if I was to look at uh, just a map of how, or a process line, uh, the more you can codify uh, into the U.S. system, whether by law, 
and or supporting laws or acts, um, it's only going to help. I look at NATO. I mean, look at the conversations that have surrounded NATO over its period of time. You know, is the U.S. going to leave NATO? Or, or um, you know, how are we going to get people to uh, commit to their actual support of NATO? At, at times, NATO had, was on some pretty tenuous grounds. We've survived it. I think having, having quote, unquote, the great power competition solidifies uh, the permanency of the, of, of the agreement. Cool, thank you. Our next question, Andrew Green. Uh, Secretary Andrew Green from the ABC. There's been a debate for some time about the transparency, future transparency of the ocean, whether submarines can be detected. Can you comment on the United States Navy's ability to detect hostile submarines and where you see the PRC's ability in this area in future years? Do you think it could be quite advanced by the time Australia gets its first nuclear-powered boats? Well, let's look at the lines of technology, uh, a, a timeline along the x-axis and the product being developed on the y-axis. You name the technology, it's always quicker than people think. It's something that, uh, it, to be very frank with you, this is a perfect reason that I want to kick down ITAR and start working with Australian technologies, working with all other technologies to ensure that it probably will be developed, but we want to have a hand in it and we want to have the ability to use it. Right now, I think, once again, I think the, the submarine is probably our most stealthiest, uh, and I say we collectively, anyone who has submarines, it is the stealthiest weapons platform we have. Can that change? It certainly can. Technology has proven it, 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 that it will happen. Let us make sure that we're there first, we being collectively, everyone I'm talking about in this room, to make sure that we avail ourselves of it. And on another topic, there's been considerable discussion of dual crewing mixed crews going into the future for Australia. Uh, there has also been, uh, from senior officials, discussion of uh, joint operations or combining the forces operationally. How far can you see that happening? Do you think there could be resistance within the US system or even in this region in the Pacific? I'd like to see it happen yesterday. I mean, the fact that you have teams already in Charleston going through the training program is great, and they're in the upper 30 percent of the class, I was told. Um, but uh, we have to have that. We have to have that tomorrow. We can't do that quick enough. Um, this is what I'm talking about. It's no longer business as usual. And, and, I, and I have a great respect for the Chief of Naval Operations, Mike Gilday, and I know he's running an enterprise. But you know what? We got to start thinking outside of the box to accelerate this to ensure that we are sharing, we are learning, and bring the curve closer to us. No, you know, we, we can't afford to sit here and, and, and battle administrivia. We have to get to the goal. Uh, next question from Daniel Hurst. Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Uh, one of the threads running through the questions has been about Australian involvement in a future potential conflict. I want to come at it from a slightly different angle. Uh, you mentioned the various conflicts since the Second World War that Australia and the US have stood side by side at. Uh, in your view, um, what lessons can be learnt from the Iraq War 20 years ago? There's a lot of reflections given it's, given it's the 20th anniversary. What at its core went wrong there with that decision? And should it give Australia pause for thought about signing on to US strategy? So if I was to say as Richard Spencer what I think the problems were, is something I referred to earlier. Exploration and discussion and agreement on the second, third, and fourth order of effects. Do we have the plan all the way down to the fourth order of effect? What we've learned from this, and this is why I'd, I personally would like to have more voices at the table asking those exact questions. We've been by your side for every single one of the conflicts. Some of them haven't turned out that well. Have we thought about second, third order of effects? And that's where the responsibility actually is on that party at the table to vet that out. So do you think in Washington, um, the Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong's approach about encouraging guardrails uh, to responsibly manage competition, I know it's something the President has talked about, but is that a contribution that is welcomed in Washington in your view? Oh, I think it's welcome. I think we have to have the discussion, most definitely. Thank you. Um, one of the 
audience members here today is the, the Lithuanian ambassador to Australia. Um, obviously, that part of the world has a, a front row seat to the conflict that's going on in Ukraine. Do you think, a um, couple, couple of Ukraine related questions, do you think the events of what's happened in Ukraine has given China pause for thought about um, Taiwan? And, and secondly, uh, Ukraine in general, what, what, what do you think the lessons are that we, we, we're learning from, from, that, that, from that war and, and, um, and, 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 and where we go in the future? I think there's a, a litany of, of lessons, um, starting with, I think we overestimated the strength of Russia. Uh, I think we overestimated their production, their productivity capabilities. Um, I have a worry about Ukraine because when it comes to, and I'm addressing this from the United States, when it comes to resolve, which is one thing that we really do have to go back to the weight room and do the sets and reps to make sure that we have resolve. We're, this is a proxy war. It's very easy to write a check. Um, the treasures of sons and daughters, or uh, our sons and daughters, are not being applied over there. That concerns me to a degree that do, does the U.S. population think that, oh, we, proxy wars are the way we're going to go forward. Um, you cannot, I don't believe, you cannot have a conflict where you want stabilization without boots on the ground. You can't just have a missile war. Um, lessons learned um, are along those lines uh, when it comes to what is President Xi learning about this. It's, it's an encyclopedia on how we fight, quote unquote, we collectively as allies in a situation such as that, i.e., where are we applying resources uh, and training. Um, he saw what happened to Russia on logistics, on the ability to put strategy in place. I think they're learning a lot. Your point about it can't just be a missile war and, and needing boots on the ground. So what, what, what does the West's response there need to be there? Do, you, do we need to send in Western forces perhaps to help support the Ukrainians? Again, I'm not, uh, I'm not that close inside the Department of Defense to know what the strategies are per se. I can, tell you that all I know is what I read in the paper, and right now we're not sending people in there. <laughs> Next question, Dominic uh, Gianni. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your address today. Um, the Australian taxpayer is getting asked to stump up a lot of money for these submarines over the next three decades, and a lot of the terms that we're hearing um, from officials are stuff like strategic competition, contested environment. Those terms don't mean a lot to people at home. I'm just wondering, given you now in civilian clothing, can you use layman's terms to explain how we're going to use submarines to protect our interests like trade routes if we're not at war? Ah, well, you just hit the nail on the head with trade routes. So 92% of commerce goes over the ocean. I beg your pardon, 76% of commerce goes over the ocean. 97% of comms go under the ocean. You have to protect that. If, in fact, China wants to make a play for Power dominance, look what they've done already with cutting of cables in Taiwan. Uh, you have to be able to show that you're in the area. Back in 1992, there's a great phrase, peace through presence. Uh, I call it power through deterrence. Uh, you have to be on the beat. You have to be on the patrol, and that's exactly what this platform is meant to do in layman, layman's terms. And then, so given that we talk uh, so heavily about partnerships in our region, can this be counterintuitive given that, um, you know, Asian nations, Pacific nations are a bit frosty over this submarine deal given that it, it includes nuclear material? God bless the State Departments in both countries. They're going to have to get out there and, and earn their pay. <laughs> <laughs> um, putting aside Taiwan, and we, we had former Prime Minister Paul Keating addressed the club last week and he, among his points was that China is not a threat uh, to Australia sort of thing and, and he sort of narrowed it to, I think the interpretation was it narrowed it to an, inv an invasive threat. But what is the threat um, broadly in your mind that, that China poses to the, to the order, to the international order and to other countries? As I said, put aside Taiwan, which is very clear, but the broader issue. So, uh Joe was nice enough to uh, hand me his phone, and I watched Prime Minister Keating's presentation, 
and I will agree with him on one point and one point only, and that's that the People's Republic of China Navy will not come and do an amphibious assault on the western half of Australia. Yes. Uh, again, I go back to Sun Tzu. What is their goal? Their goal is to have control over the assets without ever firing a shot. This is what we have to worry about, the weaponization of capital, Sri Lankan harbor. Um, uh, you, you look at what they're doing in, in, in Africa. Um, I, I, I always try to lead with this by saying, in my mind, there's a seat for China at the international table of trade if they acknowledge rule-based order. They're not, going to, they're, they're not acknowledging it now, and I don't know if they will in the near future. So how do we compete against them? Well, we compete against them, I believe, as I've just laid out here, you band together and you, go, you compete one-on-one -on -one against China. What is the threat? The threat is power application where it will affect our way of life. All of a sudden, the nine dash line now gets, uh, in their mind, that is, the, that is their boundaries. Uh, they no longer acknowledge 200 mile fishing limits. They start consuming more protein than the laws allow. I mean, there's impact to our society that can happen in that regard. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Nick Stewart. Nick Stewart, Canberra Times. Can I follow up Dominic's question? Uh, the, we, the majority of our trade, I mean, the enormous majority of our trade is with China. Why would China possibly want to uh, sink or interfere with that trade? I mean, why do we need, and secondly, why do we need submarines to do an impossible task anyway? What's the impossible task? The impossible task is defending ships from missiles rather than, I mean, on, on the assumption that we have moved way beyond 1940, 41, 42, so you're, you're not going to sink ships with torpedoes anymore. You're going to sink, sink them with missiles. Right. So fired, fired, from, fired from submarines and or land base. Yeah. So why, if, if you're going to have the possibility of land-based um, uh, land missiles sinking ships, why bother with developing submarines to protect them? Because your submarine is your stealth tactical missile launcher. Okay. They don't know where it is. So you, you, how long will the water remain non-transparent? How long will it be we just, before? We, we address that. I mean, I, I don't know. There will be technology, yes. OK. And sorry, on a different issue, um, uh, it, you mentioned Willow Run and uh, the Liberator Bomber, B-24. Um, that, that was a fantastic piece of equipment. But of course, it wasn't masses of liberators that uh, caused Japan and um, Germany to surrender. It was a small team working at Los Alamos um, who came up with the nuclear weapon, and that was the cataclysmic reason that the other side uh, decided it had to surrender. Isn't the biggest advantage of this, uh, the, the AUKUS collaboration actually not to do with submarines at all, but rather to do with intellectual sharing, uh, the development of a new uh, Los Alamos, a, a method of collaborating to provide ideas that are providing new me means of uh, uh, cooperating, new ways of, of seeing the world. Isn't that far more important than the actual submarine itself, which could become a moded by 2050, by the time that we're expecting it to come into operation. Thank you for my dissertation. <laughs> I, I think you have to have both, but I will say I don't know what a submarine looks like in 20 years from now. And anyone who tells you what that is, I will have a debate with only because technology will have such a major input. But you hit the nail on the head with exactly what I'm talking about, directed energy. Can we all get together on that to find other means that will prevent. That's exactly it. Thanks. How do we guard against AUKUS, though, becoming a, essentially a, a sort of a wealth transfer, effectively, from, from Australia to the US? I mean, how do, how, do, how do we ensure an enduring capability is built here in Australia? 
day one, we all start working together. You knock down ITAR and you start getting commerce transfer and productivity transfer amongst countries, it'll overshadow the cost of, of, of AUKUS. So, um, so with that, it, it's, it's a case of um, embedding it, but how, like, what, what do we as Australia need from an industrial point of view to embed that though? I mean, we don't have many homegrown prime contractors, for instance. No, but I've seen some of the most eye-watering technologies coming out. Just, just in a reception that we had at Joe's house last night, I had four people come up to me with proven design technologies that we, I have not seen in the U.S. So just because you don't have primes, which might actually be a very good thing, to be very frank with you, it doesn't mean you're not in the game. You are a contributor in the game. The game is changing. Look at new space. New space is no longer dominated by the primes. You can go out and send a satellite up in the air right now. That is a beautiful thing. And we should be doing as much as we can together to make sure the cost of that and the ability of that increases. Or a Chinese balloon, perhaps. <laughs> um, <laughs> our, our next question from Tony Melville. Uh, Tony Melville, the director of the National Press Club. Um, you talked about boots on the ground, but there, has been so, there have been so many developments with drones. Uh, this broadcast is largely done with drone cameras behind and in front. Apologies to the couple of cameras in the room. Um, in keeping the port of Odessa opened, it was partly uh, kept open with the use of the unmanned surface vehicles. US Navy, possibly under you, uh, has ordered a whole bunch, and this is terrible for the voice to text, of AUKUS um, unmanned drone submarines, O-R-C-A-S. Um, you know, where do they sit alongside uh, things like the AUKUS submarine? And, you know, in your conversations, um, it, as I said, boots on the ground versus unmanned vehicles where no lives are at risk, the flying drones, the undersea drones, the surface drones. Where, what's the balance there? So they're all additive. That's the most important thing to understand. They're all additive to what is in there on a legacy basis. And as legacy platforms time out or become less effective or less capable, your new technologies are taking their place. But right now, Orcus is an example, is a developing technology that would work right alongside with the systems that we all have collectively as allies. And that's the way to view it. When I talk about boots on the ground, it's more once the kinetic action has stopped, how do you actually control the situation? Um, I'm sure I'll be shocking and say maybe in 10 years we'll have a military robot that can actually walk down the street and stand. seen the movie. Right, exactly. I mean, we think that's a, a, a amazing. Well, when I watched, you know, Star Trek, they talked about the ion thruster. We have ion thrusters now. Um, I, I can't look that far into the future, but all the additive technologies we're talking about now, I, I used I, to be duplicative, are additive. Uh, next question uh, from Morris Riley on behalf, I think, of uh, Tim Shaw. Our... Tim Shaw, just Tim Shaw, yeah. Um, Tim Shaw's the director of the club. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, China is a sovereign nation with a right to expand its military material as it sees fit, particularly Navy and submarine assets. This raises concerns for the United States and its allies. Um, who is capable to begin the long journey of detente in 2023? Remember when former presidents used to play that role to settle tensions? That is a terrific question because, um, <laughs> as I jokingly said, the State Departments are going to be working for their pay. That is a critical crux. Uh, if you looked at the United States Navy, um, we have direct communications with Russia when it comes to safety at sea, where we can pick up the phone and talk about what's going on in the Bering Straits with our counterparts in the Russian Navy. We call to China, there's no answer. Um, if, in fact, they are going to be on the global stage of being a responsible superpower, they have to act on all fronts, one would hope. Um, included in that would be the ability to work stateside on statecraft. Uh, my, my second question is, uh, since you're in a civilian uh, suit today, uh, you might like to chant your arm about the next uh, Republican nominee uh, for the president. What do you think of Nikki Haley's chances of becoming the first female US president? Um, 
I always make a disclaimer that, uh, especially as the elections kind of uh, gear up, uh, the only thing I can guarantee you is it's not going to be like it looks right now. Um, the, the, the horses change in every turn of the lap. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Nikki Haley and what she's done. Uh, I'll put it this way, I wish her the best of luck. It would be fascinating to have a female president in the White House. I'm a proponent of that. But I'm also a proponent it has to be the best player. Okay. Thank you. Very diplomatic answer there. <laughs> but perhaps you could be Secretary of State next time around. <laughs> um, next question from Kim Bergman. Uh, Kim Bergman again, thank you. Um, as I understand it, in the United States, the highest priority for the USN is the Columbia-class ballistic missile firing submarines. Uh, you also have SSNX not too far away. Um, so to increase the production of Virginia-class looks like it's a really big ask. So I'm wondering if you can be a bit more specific about the sorts of things that you think are necessary. Is it money, people, legislation, all of the above? Uh, it's, it's always money, but right now the DOD is awash in money. They don't say that, but there's quite a bit of money in the DOD budget. As you all know, it's public knowledge. Um, I truly, you're, you're spot on. There's a lot on the Navy's plate. How do we, how do we get the step change put in place, I believe is your question. That step change is thinking outside the box. That step change is the initiation of industrial policy to turn around and have maybe some of our automobile, our agriculture manufacturing companies turn around and manufacture parts. Because as we all know, or you may know, when it comes to the Virginia class and as we're learning in the Columbia class, it, it, there are components that are pre-assembled and then loaded in in modules. Could you distribute that? Yes, you could. But you're gonna have to give the private sector an impetus to do that. That is government's job. But it's going to be a step change. We can't just sit around here, specifically in the US, and wave our hands and go, great power competition, and not do anything. We have to go, great power competition, let's compete. And this is how we'll do it. That's what I'd like to see. Well, and presumably, you see Australia as part of this future, the ability to contribute components to future classes of submarines? I have, I have banged the table from the day one as Secretary of the Navy being a commercially oriented people. If they're allies, why don't we buy from them? We do have a nationalistic wrap on the DOD, which, ha just like ITAR, has to be released. If, in fact, the Virginia-class submarine has 4,800 ball valves and we can only produce 2,000 and you have another 2,000, why wouldn't I buy them from Australia? Yes. Please, please deliver that message to the uh, UK government on our behalf. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, our final question uh, from Anna Henderson again. Thank you. Secretary, you've spoken about the need to amass this great military power in the many hundreds of billions of dollars to avoid a war. But at the same time, there are billions of people in poverty across the globe. And this money is being put into a capability that we're hoping to never use. Why is that justifiable? And given your own experience with the military and what you talked about with the pointing of the dial, why should anyone join the Defence Forces? OK, to answer your first question, um, that is the job of government, is the allocation of resources. A footnote there from my observation, the most inefficient distributor of, of resources are governments. How do we make the dollar go further is the question that should be asked day one. The deposit that you're making for peace, we're all making for peace, for order, is a meaningful deposit. And yes, we have to figure out. Look, I sit here and say that I'm a, I, I, I am compassionate about my fellow person. When I had my Navy hat on, my first regard is the security of the country. Well, the security of the country is also feeding people. I get it. We have to figure a way to make the system more efficient so dollars can go further on both sides of the equation. The waste inside government is stunning. The waste inside the DOD is even more stunning. We can tighten the belt. We can tighten the focus. It's hard work. N human nature does not like to work hard. We have to get after this. And that is part of leadership. And just in terms of your experience with the Defence Forces and what can happen oh. in the theatre of battle, why should people decide to join up? Well, the, the, the biggest driving force is pride in country and giving back. 
If, in fact, you love the country that you live in and you realize that freedom is not free, something has to be given for it. And there is a group of people who stand up and say, I will serve my country to give back. Um, is it a scientific allocation? No, it isn't. You're seeing us bump into it in the U.S. where we're not making our recruiting numbers, and we have to think outside the box again. I sit here and laugh when I read an uh, article about um, my former CNO, who was a great guy, John Richardson, who, had, who headed up uh, naval reactors, and he got criticized for coming over here and consulting you all. He is the most amazing asset that we have. He understands the whole thing. You would want him to be a consultant. And oh, by the way, when I recruit, why wouldn't I want to tell someone, we're going to give you an amazing skill set, and we want you for 10, 15, 20 years. And after that, you have a whole career of your own that we have given you the education. Why don't we promote that versus saying, what the hell is an admiral making that much money, a retired admiral, on dimes that we've invested in him? It's a counterintuitive logic. We're going to have to sit out there and tell people, not only come to defend your country, but we're going to give you a skill set where you're going to have a life afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, Richard Spencer, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> we, we, and no one goes home empty-handed. Membership of the Press Club. The good news, it's reciprocal rights access to the National Press Club. But it expires DC. tomorrow. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.